Hello, and welcome back into another episode of the Big Ten Blitz. I'm your host, Sean. Believe it or not, we are now into May, which means spring practice has come to a close across the country. The spring transfer portal window, uh, that's now closed. That won't open up until the season starts again. And rosters are really all but finalized. Aside from a few guys in the transfer portal who haven't committed yet, the rosters that you see right now are really going to be the rosters when the season kicks off in four months. So aside from some recruiting updates over the next few months, we really are in college football's dead zone right now. So I thought this would be a perfect time to go through and recap the biggest things we saw out of the Big Ten throughout these spring practices and ultimately the spring game. So I took the liberty of watching all the Big Ten spring games. Some of them were really fun watches. The other ones, not so much, kind of a snoozer. But I have a list of my biggest takeaways from watching these games. And before we dive into those, it is worth reminding everyone that these spring games that we covet so much are glorified spring practices. So there's not usually live tackling in these. It's not at 100% speed. It's really for coaches to take a look at these second and third stringers more so than anything. So it is really hard to have big sweeping declarations or major insights into these teams as a whole. That being said, there are some players and some position groups that really popped that I'm either really excited about or concerned for, and we'll go through those right now. So going to go in chronological order, start off with the first group of spring games, which happened at this point, I think about four weeks ago, and we'll just go through my list, my bullets of the biggest takeaways from every spring game. We don't cover every single team here today because like I said, some of these spring games, it's just hard to get major insights from, but these are... I think, the the most notable ones. So to kick things off, we'll start off with Ohio State's spring game. They were the first Big Ten team to have their spring game. And we'll start on the defensive side of the ball. I've been vocal about how good I think this Ohio State defense is going to be, that they have the potential to be one of, if not the best defense of this 21st century. And what I saw in the spring game only confirmed my assumptions, and it was really the secondary that popped out to me. You kind of know the talent they have at safety. Lathan Ransom was on pace for an all Big Ten season last year before getting hurt against Wisconsin, and he comes back. Um, He returns to start at safety, and then they brought in Caleb Downs from Alabama, number one player in the portal. So that safety position seems pretty solidified, but it's these cornerbacks that really popped out to me and really made my jaw drop at some of the plays they were able to make, matching up against the Ohio State wide receivers, which we all know are among the most talented in college football. And the scary thing about this Ohio State secondary is it looks like they have four bona fide lockdown cornerbacks who could be the first cornerback on a lot of college football teams. We have Denzel Burke, who is obviously the alpha in this room. He could have been a borderline first round draft pick if he went to the draft this year. Uh, We have Davison Igbenosum. He transferred from Ole Miss last year. He started last year, had a great season. And I think he, I was most impressed with him out of these, all these cornerbacks he was targeted three different times in the end zone I think it was too where he did not give up an inch of space and he was right there to bat the ball away really impressive play from him there's Jordan Hancock who's probably the best athlete out of these group of cornerbacks and then Jermaine Matthews who played really well again in the spring game and he was the best freshman cornerback in all of college football last year so they got four bona fide lockdown cornerbacks and they just proved that in the spring game in my eyes going up against these wide receivers granted this isn't like the 2021 Ohio State wide receiver room who had Garrett Wilson Chris Olave Marvin Harrison Jr. and Jackson Smith and Jigba it's not that level of talent but there is talent in this room they produce NFL talent every single year and the way that they were locked up and the way these cornerbacks did not give up really an inch of separation all day really spoke volumes I think it's great news for Ohio State means this season if they can get a lead on a team it's going to be really hard to mount a comeback against this Ohio State team with as good as this secondary is. That was my first big takeaway. This Ohio State secondary, not only is the strength of their team, I think it is the best position unit in all of college football. And I think they have the potential to be the best secondary we've seen in college football since the 2001 Miami Hurricanes. And that team had Ed Reed, Sean Taylor, Antrell Roll, a few other guys. So not saying they're better than them. That is an all-time secondary and that's I think the measuring stick that any great pass defense should be measured up against but 
man, this Ohio State secondary looks scary good. And I think in five years, it's this is the kind of position group where you look back on and then you look at these names and see what they're doing in the NFL and you're like, wow. But I had one other takeaway for Ohio State. We'll flip to the offensive side of the ball for this. And it's the quarterback battle. And heading into this spring game, Julian Sayan, the Alabama transfer, true freshman, was gaining a lot of steam. Apparently, he had been playing really well in these spring practices and there was some whispers that he was maybe pushing Will Howard to be the starting quarterback. But after watching this spring game, it's clear to me this is a two-horse race between Devin Brown and Will Howard. And it is a really tight battle too. Honestly, coming out of the spring game, I could not tell you who was in the lead, who had a better game. They both played well, both made some good throws, both were comfortable, both left a couple throws on the field as well. But I think this is a battle that is going to go on throughout fall camp And honestly, I think it will go into the season a little bit too, mainly because Ohio State's first few games are pretty easy. They had a pretty easy schedule leading up to that Oregon game in October. So I think Ohio State will have the luxury of giving each of these guys a start and seeing what they can do. But as far as the actual play, I'm coming out of the spring game for Ohio State, not too concerned about their quarterback position, that quarterback room. And the biggest reason why was because Will Howard and Devin Brown both showed a willingness and ability to run the ball, scramble and in option plays, because they brought in Chip Kelly to completely revamp this running game, which has really been underperforming the past couple seasons. And a lot of what Chip Kelly does rely on the threat of a quarterback running the ball, doing option plays, RPOs, quarterback sweeps, and those types of things. So in order for this Chip Kelly run scheme to really take full form. They need a quarterback that is a willing and able runner. And Devin Brown and Will Howard, both great athletes and both prove to me that they can really run this offense and allow the offense to open up so there is less stress on this passing attack. So that being said, Will Howard or Devin Brown will have to throw the ball in order to win some games in November and in the CFP. And I think they, with how comfortable they seemed in this offense with some of the throws they made, I'm really not too concerned about where they stand right now. Definitely room for improvement, but I think all in all, I feel good about Ohio State's quarterback position coming out of the spring game. Definitely better than I felt last year when Devin Brown didn't play because he had thumb surgery and when Kyle McCord really only played and he didn't have his best game. He had one deep shot to Carnell Tate and that was it. Did not feel good about Ohio State's quarterback room last year. Feel a lot better now. So really top to bottom. I don't really see a huge weakness for this Ohio State team, and they're going to be a fascinating team to watch throughout the fall and into the season because I think, yeah, I've said it a few times, their potential is through the roof, and what I saw in the secondary, what I saw at quarterback makes me feel like this team is appropriately rated as one of the preseason national championship favorites. Moving on from Columbus, though, we'll move over to Happy Valley, where Penn State had their spring game on the same day as Ohio State. And... I know a lot of Penn State fans, their biggest takeaway from that spring game was Drew Aller's struggles. And there was a a video that went viral on Twitter online of the Drew Aller highlights, which was pretty much a three-minute video of him, of a string of incomplete passes, really. And so I know that concerned a lot of Penn State fans because now it's going from, what's wrong with Drew Aller? He was a five-star quarterback. He was supposed to be the guy that got us over the hump and now he can't even complete a pass and I know some Penn State fans were really losing their mind but I'm still not too concerned about Drew Aller first of all that spring game was played in 30 to 40 mile an hour wins against one of the nation's best defenses in a brand new offense for Penn State with Andy Kotelnicki taking over I wasn't expecting them to have this prolific offense and put up 50 points in the spring game and Drew Aller complete 90 percent of his passes like that was never going to happen. I can forgive some struggles given the competition he was going up and given the weather. I can forgive that, and I still believe that he is capable of helping to get Penn State over this hump. But what really stuck out to me watching this spring game were the wide receivers. If you watch that video that I had mentioned of (laughs) the Drew Aller incomplete passes, what really stuck out to me was the lack of separation on almost every single throw. He was trying to fit it into a a keyhole-sized hole because these wide receivers could not get more than six inches of separation on Penn State's cornerbacks. And these are cornerbacks, granted, that have to replace their top three guys from last year. It's a largely inexperienced unit, and these Penn State receivers were getting blanketed every single rep. And so that really was a red flag to me, because 
I'm at a loss with what's going on with Penn State's wide receivers. They used to develop wide receiver talent almost as well as Ohio State did. They had a string of generating really good guys to the NFL. And now I look at their wide receiver room, at least who's left, and it's who out of these guys can catch the ball. Because now they've, on top of the poor performance in the spring game, they've had three guys transfer out of that room. Dante Cephas and Malik McLean, who were their two big transfer portal pickups last year, they're both gone. And last year's wide receiver won, Keandre Lambert-Smith. He's gone. He went to Auburn. So that leaves really five guys in this wide receiver room. There's Julian Fleming, the Ohio State transfer. I've already said my piece on him. He is not a wide receiver one. If he's your wide receiver three, that's perfectly fine. But if you want to be a championship caliber offense, you cannot rely on Julian Fleming to be your first or second option. There's Harrison Wallace, who's a former four-star guy. He actually, I probably have the most faith in him out of anyone in this wide receiver room. He battled injuries last year. But then there's Omari Evans, Caden Saunders, and Liam Clifford. And those guys have a combined 26 career catches. And that's it. They haven't brought in any other transfers in this portal cycle. And they didn't bring in any wide receivers in the 2024 recruiting cycle. Those are the five guys they're looking at. And I'm just, how is Penn State expecting to get over the hump with those being their pass catchers? And granted, Michigan did prove that you don't have to have a prolific passing attack to win a national championship and compete at a high level. They won their games with their defense and their run game. But if you want to win games against great teams in November, if you want to win playoff games, you will have to come up with big plays in the passing game. That's just what you have to do to win big-time college football games nowadays. And Michigan, when they played Ohio State, when they played Alabama, and they played Washington, J.J. McCarthy came up with huge plays in the passing game in all of those games. And Drew Aller, as much as I'm defending him, he is not J.J. McCarthy. And none of these guys, none of these wide receivers on Penn State appear to be even close to Roman Wilson, who, you know, was a great receiver for Michigan, did everything that they needed in order to win a championship. But he was a, what, a fourth round draft pick in this past draft? Like, it's, you don't have to have a Marvin Harrison Jr. on your team in order to have a championship winning passing attack. But Penn State seems so far below that level right now based off of their wide receivers performance in the spring game and the departures out of that room since that game, it is just a major red flag. And listen, Penn State can win a lot of games this year with their run game and with their defense. They have two; Those two aspects of Penn State's are among the best in all of college football. But if they want to get over the hump, if they want to beat Ohio State and beat Michigan, if they want to get to the college football playoff and win games in the playoff, this passing game is going to have to develop and they will have to have a trustworthy receiver to go to in these clutch situations where you need to deliver big passing games. And based off what I've seen the past couple of years from Penn State and the spring from Penn State, I'm really worried about their ability to have that championship level passing game. My big takeaway from Penn State's spring game, not too concerned about Drew Aller, but this wide receiver situation in Happy Valley is dire. Moving on from Penn State, we have Illinois. And I was not expecting to have as much fun watching this Illinois spring game as I did, mainly because I have very low expectations for Illinois as a team in 2024. This passing game, and these wide receivers in particular, really shined in this spring game. Luke Altmaier and his backup Donovan Leary both played great at the quarterback position. They both, granted, it's easy to look comfortable in these spring games when you know you're not getting hit, but timing and accuracy are two things you can still look for in the spring game, and both of these guys displayed that perfectly. Both of them were on time with the receivers and had some really beautiful, accurate throws down the field. And both of them looked incredibly comfortable in this offense, a lot more comfortable than Luke Altmaier did at any point last season. They got the ball out quickly and confidently. Combined, Altmaier and Leary went 23 for 37 for 323 yards and four touchdowns, zero turnovers, and one sack. They did leave a few throws out there. There's certainly room for improvement and a little bit more consistent accuracy, but all around incredible play from the quarterback position. And then even the wide receivers that I was a little bit worried about because they had to replace Isaiah Williams and Casey Washington from last year. And then Pat Bryant, their clear wide receiver one was limited in this. So I was intrigued to see what these wide receivers could do. And they really stole the show. Malik Elzey, he was a a four-star prospect from 2023. Didn't see the field last year much because he struggled with drops. 
but he looks to have grown a lot. He looked like a star. He had six catches for 85 yards and a touchdown, including a beautiful contested back shoulder grab from Luke Altmeyer, which was a great throw and catch. It looked like a play from a couple veterans, not a play between two players who haven't even started, neither of which have started a full season. So Malik Elzey, he played well. Alex Kapka Jones, he played really well as well. He had four catches for 95 yards and a touchdown, had two beautifully contested catches, one diving in the middle of the field for a 40-yard gain, another one for a touchdown. So those guys both looks like stars at the wide receiver position, I think pairing them up with Pat Bryant. But this looks like a formidable Illini passing attack. And It is worth mentioning for Illinois, though, that in 2022, they had one of the best defenses in college football. Then they lost Sidney Brown and Devin Witherspoon from that secondary, and they went from one of the best defenses to one of the worst in college football. And based off of what we saw in this spring game, it looks like this defense, particularly that secondary, is going to struggle again. So this is what I'm talking about with spring games. It's hard to say that, wow, this Illinois passing game is going to be elite when they were going up against probably a really weak pass defense. So you have to keep that in mind. But this does mean if Illinois, if they want to be competitive this year, if they want to win some football games, if they want to get to a bowl game, they're going to have to put up points. And this passing game is going to have to keep up with other teams who are going to be able to probably score pretty easily against this Illinois defense. If you're an Illini fan, at least you can take solace in the fact that This passing game looks capable of putting up points, and Luke Altmaier is showing signs of development and being more comfortable in this offense, and I think they might not win a ton of games next year, but I think Illinois could be a really fun team to watch. I think Luke Altmaier, I defended him a lot last year because I don't think Illinois' struggles were not on his shoulders. This offensive line was bad. The defense was horrible. Put put Luke Altmaier in a lot of tough situations. But he looked more comfortable, he looked more confident, and I think he is ready to lead this offense to a much more successful 2024 campaign. Might not result in a ton of wins because of this defense, but I loved what I saw from Luke Altmaier, these wide receivers, and the Illini passing attack. And next I'm going to move on to Iowa. And it's funny that I'm talking about Iowa because their spring game wasn't broadcasted. The only footage I was able to find was a phone recording in the stands. It looked like a fan filmed spring game. And there wasn't any live tackling in that game as well, so certainly hard to gain a lot of insight. But one thing did jump out for me from the plays I saw in this Iowa spring scrimmage, and that was use of pre-snap motion, which is not something that I'm used to seeing Iowa do. Really what their offense almost exclusively was made up of last year were just a series of halfback dives and halfback counters right into the A-gap. And occasionally they would run a play action pass off of that and really just close their eyes and hope that Deacon Hill could complete some sort of pass. That was really their offense last year. Not a lot of creativity. New offensive coordinator Tim Lester comes in. And I think to me, it seems pretty apparent that pre-snap motion has been an emphasis for him. There was someone moving around before the snap on every single play that I watched. A lot of fullback and tight end action, you know, either moving across the line of scrimmage or breaking out wide. Running backs were moving around a lot, lining up in different spots, and wide receivers as well, moving up and down that line of scrimmage. I think utilizing pre-snap motion like that is going to be critical, not only for the passing game to try to find some mismatches, but also the run game, because there's a variety of run fits for this offense, and I think it will allow them to utilize more than just those A-B gaps on dives and counters, like I mentioned. I know it feels weird to be so excited about pre-snap motion, because that is the baseline for what offenses need to do in modern college football. But I was glad to see Iowa at least taking steps to have a modern offense, which is a very low bar to hurdle, but something they have not been able to do over the past few years. Again, Iowa's spring scrimmage with the footage I was able to watch and the fact that they had no live tackling whatsoever was really hard to gain a lot of insights from that. But they had a lot of pre-snap motion, and I think that's a great sign for this offense moving forward because they aren't going to be able to win games with the same formula they have the past couple of seasons in this newly expanded Big Ten. It is the deepest conference in college football. There is no hiding in the Big Ten West anymore. You have to play big boys week in and week out. Their offense will have to find a pulse at some point if they want to you know, be competitive and hit that 10-win mark again. And the fact that already in his short tenure, Tim Lester has implemented this kind of pre-snap motion and has made it an emphasis, I think that's good news. So I thought that was a worth no- uh, a noteworthy insight that I saw this spring. Moving up north, the Michigan Wolverines have their own 
quarterback battle to monitor. And I think theirs is one of the most interesting and maybe consequential quarterback battles in all of college football. And they had five, six guys in this quarterback battle. So a lot to get sorted out. And I think we did start to sort it out a little bit in this spring game. We'll start off with Alex Orgy, who I think is the favorite to win their starting quarterback battle. He had an up and down day, but definitely separated himself from Jaden Davis and Jaden Denigal. I don't think either of those guys are going to be real players in this quarterback battle moving into the fall. It was, it was hard to say whether or not I feel really confident in Alex Orgy as the quarterback based off of what I saw in the spring game, because first and foremost, he is an incredible athlete. He might be the most athletic quarterback in college football. And so whether or not he wins this quarterback battle and is their full-time starting quarterback, they will have a package for him to get some snaps and use his legs. Like he is that kind of athlete. You can't leave him off the field entirely. But throwing the ball, it was a very up and down day. It seemed like for Alex Orgy, for every throw he had that kind of made you raise your eyebrows a little bit and nod an approval and be like, wow, Alex Orgy looking pretty good. For every one of those throws, he had a throw that made you look away and cringe because it was painful. Like he had some wildly inaccurate throws to guys that were just open. I think his second throw of the game, if I remember correctly, was just supposed to be an easy check down to the running back in the flat and it just sailed right over his head. And he had a lot of those throws throughout the day, but he also had a few nice throws where he really put it right where it needed to be to allow for some yard after the catch. But also what I noticed with Alex Orgy is I don't think I saw him successfully get to a second read and complete a pass his whole day. Like he was very first read or take off, which is not necessarily a bad thing to be at this stage in his development. But if he wants to be the starting quarterback, he is going to have to mature quickly. And he is going to have to at least learn to get to that second read or else this Michigan offense is going to have its struggles. So I think based off of his athleticism alone, Alex Orgy is my favorite, but there's two guys tight on his tail. First is Jack Tuttle, who did not play in the spring game. He's recovering from elbow surgery, but I got to figure this seventh-year quarterback, he didn't come back for a seventh year just to be a backup again. I think he has his sights set on this starting job, and he is by far the most experienced guy. He's probably the safest option too. So I think that he is going to be firm in this battle. But then Davis Warren emerged in the second half of this spring game and he was not a guy that I had pegged to you know have his name in this quarterback battle he was un an unranked prospect from the 2021 class but that actually makes him the longest tenured Michigan quarterback because remember Jack Tuttle has spent most of his career at Indiana now, Davis Warren he has nine attempts in his career but they all came in 2022 and he had a really nice second half he had a beautiful 48 yard bomb to Kendrick Bell one of a few beautiful throws he had in that. And out of all the quarterbacks that played in that spring game for Michigan, Davis Warren looked like by far the best thrower of the football and I guess the most comfortable in this offense. But the only problem with this is that he, he was playing in the second half. He was going up against mainly reserves and scout team defense. So it's hard to take a lot away from that performance. I guess my big takeaway from the Michigan quarterback position is it's down to Alex Orgy, Davis Warren, and Jack Tuttle. I think those are the three guys vying for the starting quarterback position. But I don't feel supremely confident in where this quarterback position is sitting coming out of the spring. And... Like I said, Alex Orgy is an incredible athlete. They will utilize him in some capacity, and he will help elevate this offense, but they need someone that can you know, drive the football downfield a little bit. And I'm just not sure they have it right now. It's going to be really interesting to watch, but I think one thing is for sure, Michigan is going to have to embrace for a drastic drop in the quarterback position in 2024. And I don't think Michigan fans are really prepared for how steep that drop really is. But we'll probably find out a little bit more this fall as we continue to monitor that quarterback battle. And there is one other takeaway I had from this Michigan spring game, and it came on the defensive side of the ball. And their defensive front looked great in that game. They stuffed the run. They got after the quarterback, and it looked a lot like last year. They have a lot of talent in that defensive front. But this secondary, a little concerning. They do have Will Johnson, who is arguably the best cornerback in college football, and he is the kind of guy you can just pick a receiver, you don't want to catch the ball, and just have Will Johnson follow him all over the field. And he'll do his work. He's that good. He played Marvin Harrison Jr. last year as well as anyone did in college. And he's really the only cornerback that matched up against him that had some level of success. So he's a great talent. But outside of Will Johnson, 
I'm a little concerned about this secondary because they lost Mike Sainra still, their top nickelback to the NFL. Keon Saab transferred out of the program. And Rod Moore, they're all Big Ten safety. He got he tore his ACL last month. So this is all of a sudden a very inexperienced unit outside of Will Johnson. And based off of what I saw in the spring game, and they were matching up against the wide receiver room, who they have some talent there, but very inexperienced. Lost all of their top guys from last year. And it seemed to me like on every single route that these receivers ran, they were gaining separation. There was a completion to be had on almost all of these routes. Alex Orgy and Jaden Davis, Jaden Denigal just didn't hit on a lot of those passes, which again illustrates my concern for that quarterback position. But this secondary, it, they looked weak. I will say that they looked susceptible and they gave up separation to some receivers who really have not taken a lot of meaningful snaps at the college level. So that was a red flag to me. Obviously, Michigan coaches defense as well as anyone in college football, and you would expect them to develop and get better throughout this offseason and throughout the season. So I don't think what we saw in the spring is their finished product. But Michigan may have to win with defense even more so than they have the past three seasons in 2024. And if their secondary is a little questionable, I don't see how they would be able to keep up with a team like Ohio State or a team like Oregon, who have prolific offenses and great defenses that can slow Michigan's offense down. I'm a little concerned for that. So coming out of Michigan's spring game, offensive line, running backs, a defensive front, looked great, looked like the typical Michigan, but definitely a little worried about this quarterback competition. <clears throat> we'll be interested to see who wins it between Alex Orgy, Jack Tuttle, and Davis Warren. And this secondary is going to be uh, something to watch because I think this could be the Achilles heel of Michigan's uh, team in 2024. But moving on from Michigan, we'll stay in-state, go with the Spartans. And their spring game was really interesting because it was actually the exact opposite of what I was expecting. Heading into the spring, I thought this Spartan defensive front was the strength of their team. Guys like Simeon Barrow and Derek Harmon up front, returning Cal Halliday at linebacker, and then Chris Bogle at defensive end. I thought they had a lot of experience coming back and it would make it really hard for opposing offenses. And I thought this, I was concerned about this offense who has to replace the two best starters on their offensive line, a lot of inexperience at wide receiver, and breaking in two new quarterbacks in Aiden Childs and Tommy Schuster. But after watching this game, it's actually the exact opposite. Um, I mean, this Michigan State's offense looked really explosive. And it all started with the offensive line, which uh, really controlled the line of scrimmage all day long, got their way, made some, paved the way for some big holes. Nate Carter took it like 75 yards to the house on his first touch of the game. I mean, it was really like that all day long. They were really manhandling Michigan State's defensive front. It is worth mentioning Arthur Smith after that spring game had said this was the offensive line's best practice of the spring. So hard to say for sure that this is the kind of performance we can expect a week in and week out from them, but it was a great sign for Michigan State's offense. And I mentioned Nate Carter, their running back. He played really well at the quarterback position too. Tommy Schuster and Aiden Childs both played really well. I had Aiden Childs, pe Aiden Childs penciled in to be Michigan State's starting quarterback, but He's going to get pushed by this Tommy Schuster kid. And if you're not familiar with Tommy Schuster, he was a uh, transfer from North Dakota. He is a four-year starter entering his sixth year in college. So he's really experienced. And both of these guys looked comfortable throwing the ball. Aiden Childs left a, th left a few throws on the field, but he also proved, I think, he is more than capable of generating the explosive plays that this offense really needs and has been starved of the past few seasons. Really, all in all, I was really impressed with Michigan State's offense. I think they're going to take a huge step forward in 2024 after a dismal season last year. I feel pretty confident or comfortable that Michigan State will be able to put up points against good defenses. But now I'm a little bit concerned about Michigan State's defense. Not only because of their performance in the spring game really getting pushed around, but they had a flurry of transfers after this game, including their two best defensive linemen in Simeon Barrow and Derek Harmon. They've really been the anchors of that interior defensive line for a couple years now. And they're both gone, leaving a massive hole in this defensive front that kind of struggled from what I saw in this spring game. And then there's the secondary, who has it's been amongst the nation's worst pass defenses over the past three seasons. I didn't see a whole lot of signs of improvement in the spring game. And they had a couple other transfers out since that game as well. And Marquis Larry Jr. and Jaden Mangum, who is their best safety. 
it was just weird. Entering the spring for Michigan State, felt really confident in their defense, was worried about their offense. Now leaving the spring, I feel really good about their offense and a little bit more concerned about their defense. That being said, um, under fir- on their first year with new head coach Arthur Smith, I do feel very comfortable in, in betting that Michigan State would at least get to a bowl game. I feel really good that this is a winning football team, and I think that this is going to be the first step in a good career for Arthur Smith at Michigan State. I think if you want to see a big turnaround in a single season in college football, it's certainly difficult, but it all starts with the head coach and with the quarterback. I have all the faith in the world in Arthur Smith, and I think whether it's Aiden Childs or Tommy Schuster or some combination of them at quarterback, I feel really confident about the talent they have there and the upgrade that they made over what they've had the past few seasons. So all in all, feel good about Michigan State coming out of the spring game, but that defense, wasn't expecting to be this concerned about that defense, but here we are. Now we'll move out west for USC's spring game. And we'll start on the defensive side of the ball because that's really been their Achilles heel under Lincoln Riley. They've been really just a flat out bad defense the past three seasons, but they've also gotten progressively worse each year. So they brought in Deanton Lynn, defensive coordinator from UCLA, and I'm expecting big things out of him. I think he really rebuilt UCLA's defense in one year. I think he can do very similar things for USC. So it was really interesting to see this first look at USC's defense. And I liked what I saw out of USC's defense in this spring game, especially the secondary. They were swarming. They were everywhere, made a lot of plays, breaking up passes and being able to you know, tackle in space, make plays behind the line of scrimmage. They brought in a boatload of transfers in that secondary. A lot of them got to see the field and a lot of them played really well. I think that secondary is going to be a lot better than it was last year. Their defensive line was still getting pushed around a little bit. I've said that's going to be a multi-year fix because they need to add a lot of size to that defensive line because for whatever reason, former defensive coordinator Alex Grinch preferred smaller defensive linemen. Can't really wrap my head around that, but now they really have to do a full rebuild on that defensive front to get more size in there. That's going to be a multi-year fix, but for the most part, I saw... What I saw from USC's defense were players in position to make plays. There weren't any blown coverages. I saw fewer missed tackles. I just saw, fundamentally, a more sound defense. And, yeah, Danton Lynn is not going to turn this into a top 10 defense in one season. But I think this can certainly go from one of the worst defenses in college football to at least an average defense. And if USC can have an average defense with a Lincoln-Riley offense, they are certainly in position to be a top 25 team maybe even sniff the college football playoff. Who knows? But considering how bad they were last year, I liked what I saw out of USC's defense. But switching to the offensive side of the ball for USC, where they have their own quarterback battle to monitor between Miller Moss and UNLV transfer Jaden Maeva. And I don't think I was alone in thinking that coming into the spring, Miller Moss would run away with the battle, mainly because of that performance we saw in the bowl game. Six touchdown passes showed an absolute mastery of this offense. But the spring game, I think, busted this quarterback competition wide open. Mainly because I think both both quarterbacks struggled. And it is partly to do with having a very inexperienced wide receiver room, a lot of new faces stepping into bigger roles. And so those are new connections that kind of have to be molded with reps and with practice. And they're also going up against a secondary that I thought played really well and will be a really good secondary in 2024. But even so, both Miller Moss and Jaden Maeva missed their fair share of throws. I think, you mean, Miller Moss, he missed a wide open Jacoby Lane on a third and long on his first drive. Jaden Maeva got the ball back, and then he had a bad throw, but got bailed out on a one-handed grab by Jacoby Lane. And But then later on that drive, he got picked off on a pass he had no business making. Miller Moss got the ball back, did the same thing, got picked off on a pass he had no business making. Then Jordan Maeva gets the ball back and he underthrows Deuce Robinson on a one-on-one to the end zone where Deuce Robinson had a step. And I think even on Jaden Maeva's best throw of the day, it was a back shoulder touchdown to Makai Lemon. That throw was a little bit more inside than it really should have. And it was more of a great catch by Makai Lemon to go back shoulder, but then go and grab the ball from the defender. But that was Jaden Maeva's best throw of the day. And it was more so a great catch by Makai Lemon. My point was neither of, the, neither of these quarterbacks really stepped up and grabbed this quarterback competition and stakes their, stakes their name to it. 
But the reason I think this is now busted wide open is Jaden Maeva pre- proved that if the passing game isn't working, he has legs. He can take off. He is a great athlete, and he has the athleticism that Miller Moss doesn't. So that makes me think that this quarterback competition is wide open and could be even leaning a Jaden Maeva's way because these are both quarterbacks stepping into much bigger roles than they are used to. And they're, I think, playing in the Big Ten with as many great defenses as the Big Ten has, there are going to be days where the passing game just is not clicking and you cannot count on completing 70% 70 of your passes and putting up 50 points. You can't expect that every week in the Big Ten. So with that, I think it'll be it would be useful to have Jaden Maiva and his athleticism and his running ability to lean back on. So that's why I think actually coming out of the spring, Jaden Maiva may be the favorite to win the starting job, but this will be a really interesting battle to monitor throughout the fall. And again, this is one that might bleed into the season a little bit because I'm sure Lincoln Riley doesn't want the loser of this battle hitting the portal as soon as the season starts. So that was my takeaway with the quarterbacks. Definitely a little disappointed with their performance, but good to have Jaden Maeva's Uh, mobility to to lean back on and they were going up against a secondary that I think played really well so those were my takeaways from USC's spring game next we'll move out to Nebraska the Huskers spring game and there was one guy I wanted to watch in this spring game and one guy alone and he showed out Dylan Raiola played really well and he hasn't been named the Huskers starting quarterback quite yet, but if the spring game was any indication, he is the clear guy for the job. He is more than ready to step into a starting role as a true freshman in the Big Ten, and he is ready to elevate this offense far beyond the struggles that we saw out of them last year. And listen, it wasn't perfect. He I had an interception where it wasn't really his fault. He kind of threw back, hit receiver back a little bit, went off his hands, and he had a few overthrows as well. And even on his long touchdown pass, the receiver had to adjust off his route to go back and track that ball. But his release is just so smooth, and he is able to throw the ball from so many different arm angles. It is, the way he throws the ball is Mahomes-esque a little bit because he has that sidearm, and he can get, he just can put get so much air under that ball. And he just looks so comfortable. He looked able to extend plays, but kept his eyes downfield. He hit a lot of different receivers, seems to have built a good connection with these Husker receivers really quickly, and capable of generating big plays, of chunk plays. And that's what Nebraska's offense really struggled with last year, was one, holding onto the ball, and two, generating chunk plays of 15, 20 plus yards. And I think Dylan Rayola proved to use capable of doing both of those. I didn't see him make any throws that he shouldn't, where, man, what are you doing? You have no business making that throw. Didn't see any of that out of Dylan Rayola, didn't force it, and he looked really accurate on his deep balls, and for the most part was accurate throughout the day. So I think Nebraska stock is way up right now. This defense, who you know they had one of the best single season defensive turnarounds I've seen, or at least I can recall, and I think they're only gonna get better in year two under Tony White's defense. They lose only four starters from last year, so this defense is gonna be elite again. This offense only has to be average in order for them to to be a winning football team. And I think they can be a lot more than average with Dylan Rayola based off of what we saw in that spring game. So really excited about the Huskers and can't wait to see Rayola take his first real collegiate snaps in the game because I think he's got a special career ahead of him. And I know it sounds like I'm drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit for Nebraska, but it's hard not to when you watch that game. Sure, he had his overthrows. Sure, he wasn't perfect, but he is a true freshman quarterback who should be getting ready for his prom. Instead, he's proving that he's ready to bring Nebraska back to national relevance. He is certainly ahead of where you would expect a true freshman quarterback to be, and that's a win for Nebraska this spring. Moving back out west, though, for Oregon spring game, I had a couple takeaways for those, both centered around the line of scrimmage. Really, their defense as a whole really stood out, but that defensive line looks really hard to block. They were swarming the whole afternoon. Tatum, Tuioti, and Ben Roberts both had great days on that defensive line. Granted, they were playing an offensive line that were rotating guys a lot, trying to get as many guys reps as possible. But the defensive line looked as good as advertised with Mateo Uyunglele, Tatum Tuioti, and Blake Purchase all returning at defensive end. And then that interior looking really strong as well. Um, Really confident about Oregon's defensive line. And to win in the Big Ten, win in November, and ultimately win the Big Ten, you need to have a strong defensive line. Ohio State and Michigan have proven that over the past decade, and I think Oregon has a defensive line that a Big Ten champion would should have. 
when it's switching to the offensive side of the ball, I think if Oregon does have a question mark, it probably is that offensive line a little bit. And, you know, listen, Dylan Gabriel proved he is the best quarterback in the Big Ten, at least at this point, by a good margin. Ball was coming out of his ball, his hand fast and accurately, and he's got loads of weapons around him. A returning 1,000-yard receiver, Tess Johnson, Texas A&M transfer, Evan Stewart, who had a beautiful touchdown grab in the end zone. He looks ready to step up to become an elite receiver in the Big Ten. Running backs, Jordan James and Jay Harris, and then tight end Ter- Terrence Ferguson, like, They have firepower, the offensive skill position players, and they are going to be capable of picking up chunk yard play after chunk yard play. But again, if there is a concern I have for this Oregon offense is around this offensive line and their ability to consistently get a push in that run game. And can Oregon, when they're going up against an elite defense in November in the playoff, are they able to go on long sustained drives? Can they go on an eight? 10, 12, 15 play drive and eat up clock and grind out wins like we saw Michigan do so many times over the past three years. Are they capable of that or are they going to be leaning too heavily on those explosive plays? Because explosive plays are great. Putting up 40, 50 points a game are great. But I think Ohio State with CJ Stroud proved that to win in the Big Ten, you can't just have an elite passing game. You can't just have all these chunk yardage plays. You need to be able to grind out drives. You need to be able to really burden defenses with a punishing run game. And that's something I'm not so certain Oregon has at this point. So love their defense. Don't see weakness there. Defensive line showed out. Offensively, what I'm really looking forward as we go into the fall and start this season is how consistent can this offensive line be and can this team grind out drives or are they too dependent on the explosive play? Then moving on to my final bullet, the final team that we're going to talk about in today's spring recap, uh, Rutgers Scarlet Knights. And I've been on record talking about how talented and experienced this Rutgers roster is, and that if you take away the quarterback position, I truly believe Rutgers has a top 25 roster in college football. They are that good this year. But obviously, in the game of football, quarterback position It's important in order to win games. And they had a battle going on between Ethan Kalikmanis, the Minnesota transfer, and Gavin Wimsat, the returning starter who's been with the program going on four years now. And after I watched that spring game, the one thing I was looking at was the quarterback position. And the one note I had for Rutgers was that Ethan Kalikmanis is Rutgers starting quarterback. It was clear as day watching that spring game. But I expected Greg Schiano, as he's done with the quarterback position, sit in his second stint at Rutgers to drag his feet, not really declare a starter and be a little indecisive with it and probably drag this competition out longer than it should have. But my surprise, a couple days after I watched that spring game, he announced Ethan Kelly Kmanis as Rutgers starting quarterback and Gavit Wimsett entered the transfer portal. Now listen, Ethan Kelly Kmanis did not have a perfect game by any stretch of the imagination. He certainly missed on a few throws and was late on a few reads, but All in all, I thought he had a really good day and really illustrated just how much Rutgers has been lacking at the quarterback position for years. Because Kalik Manis, he was able to get these short throws, short out routes. He was able to get those out on time and accurately and quickly and allow for some yards after the catch opportunities. And he had displayed some beautiful ball placement on some deep shots. One was on a deep pass on his second possession. The other one on a touchdown pass to Nassim Brantley in the corner of the end zone. This really great accuracy. And it was being able to stretch the ball vertically. And in these really short passes that he was able to get out and complete consistently, it was in those throws that he just outclassed Gavin Wimsett. He was, Gavin Wimsett in his fourth year at the program still struggled to complete five-yard throws or checkdowns. And when he did, they were usually not exactly where they needed to be and caused the receiver to turn around and then eliminated that yard after the catch ability. And it's just watching these two quarterbacks go at it that really illustrated just how starved Rutgers has been for any level of quarterback talent, really, really since uh, Greg Schiano's first stint with the program. Because Kalik Manis, listen, he struggled for Minnesota last year. He completed like 53% of his passes, had a 14-9 to touchdown to interception ratio. There was a reason they went 6-7 and last year and struggled to move the ball offensively. And Kalik Manis probably is not a top 10 quarterback in the conference. And even so, he showed more talent and more touch and more consistency at the quarterback position than any quarterback I've seen put on a Rutgers uniform in, in 
since they've joined the conference, at the very least. And I think with Ethan Calic Manis as their quarterback, listen, this offense is not going to be averaging 40 points a game, but they have a great offensive line. They have a great defense. They have one of the best running backs in the country in Kyle Manungai. They have a much healthier and deeper wide receiver room than they had last year. This is a team that's ready to make some noise, get to a bowl game for a second straight season, and maybe even sniff the top 25. I don't think that's out of the question for Rutgers if they can get some sort of consistency at the quarterback position. And they seem to have it. For all his flaws, he was, I think one of his biggest issues at Minnesota last year was not taking the layup and forcing the ball downfield a little bit too much and just making poor decisions. And I didn't see that in the in the spring game. He really didn't have a throw where you're like, ooh, where are you going with that? He certainly, his accuracy has to be reeled in a little bit. But he was consistently accurate within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. He was able to get the ball out quickly and decisively and show tremendous touch on some deep balls. And I think he will be able to stretch this offense vertically a little bit. It is just really interesting to see a quarterback that struggled so much at Minnesota last year step into a program like Rutgers and really just turn around this quarterback position so quickly. So excited about what's coming out of Rutgers because the quarterback position was the one position to really keep an eye on for Rutgers and all in all, it sucks to say goodbye to Gavin Wimsett. Would have really liked to see Rutgers had him have a homegrown, developed quarterback. And even if he wasn't the starter, would have been nice to have him in as maybe a, a wildcat quarterback to use in some packages. Best of luck to Wimsett. Hope he finds a starting job somewhere else and can continue to develop as a quarterback. So it sucks losing Wimsett and losing that depth. But I think coming out of the spring, Rutgers should be more confident in their quarterback position than they've been since they've been in the Big Ten. And I think that could set up Rutgers for a sneaky good season in 2024. But that's going to do it for this episode of the Big Ten Blitz. Appreciate you hanging in there with me. It was fun recapping the spring. Make sure you check out our website, thefloorslap.com, where Jordan posts basketball content every week. I just posted a couple of new football articles, one breaking down how some Big Ten players are fit, fitting with their NFL teams and our first edition of the Big Ten Power Rankings for 2024. So make sure you go check that out. Follow us on Twitter, at The Floor Slap, and uh, subscribe to us on YouTube or Spotify, wherever you're listening right now, And because we'll have plenty more episodes coming at you over these next months and help you get through this college football dead season. So it's been a blast, as always. I've been your host, Sean, and hope to catch you here next time on the Big Ten Blitz. Thanks. Oh,